pleased to bring you the next installment of CFTC Talks. Today we present the research from Dr. Richard Haynes and Dr. Lee Horn McPhail of our Chief Economist's Office, assessing the impact of the leverage ratio on the competitive landscape of U.S. derivatives markets. This research was initially released as a staff report. I hope you find this podcast informative and helpful. Please also listen to the important disclaimer at the end of the podcast. Thank you, Mel. I am Richard Haynes. And I am Lee Ho McPhail. As Mel mentioned, our office conducts rigorous economic analysis of derivatives markets and, where needed, partners with other divisions at the CFTC to integrate economic analysis into commission policy. Our research often focuses on the impact or potential impact of policy changes on our markets. It is often difficult to clearly identify a direct causal link between a change in policy and an observed change in markets. Markets change all the time for many different reasons. Trying to determine whether these changes are caused by one specific factor is often extremely difficult. However, in certain cases, the job of distinguishing signal from noise is a bit easier. In this podcast, we discuss one of these cases, the impact of enhanced capital rules on derivative markets. After the financial crisis, international regulators agreed to implement a number of financial market reforms. Included in these reforms was a requirement that banks hold more capital to cover unexpected losses during financial stress. Capital can roughly be thought of as a difference between the assets and the liabilities of a bank. In recent years, increased capital requirements have been implemented around the globe, leading to a safer and more robust financial system. Still, regulators continue to analyze how capital is best distributed across a bank's business lines as well as how large a bank's capital buffer should be. These questions are complex because a bank needs to satisfy a number of different capital requirements. For instance, banks need to make sure that their capital levels exceed both a risk-based as well as a non-risk-based metric. One area where market participants have expressed concerns about capital rules is in the CFTC's regulated markets. These concerns have focused on the leverage ratio, what is considered the binding capital rule for many derivative businesses. The leverage ratio is designed to be minimally risk-weighted capital rule. Because of this, it is generally intended as a backstop to risk-weighted capital requirements. The leverage ratio sets capital levels relative to the notional size of a derivative portfolio. For many derivatives businesses, the leverage ratio then becomes the binding capital constraint because the underlying risk of a position is significantly lower than the corresponding notional size of the position. To identify whether the leverage ratio was binding, we focused on cleared derivatives, those risk managed at CCPs. To cover their counterparty credit risk, CCPs collect margin against all cleared positions. This margin is used to cover position losses if an entity using the CCP defaults. Though margin is posted by everyone using the CCP, in practice, the entities directly facing the CCP are large banks or similar institutions, the set of clearing members. Smaller entities or individuals like you and me need to place margin with clearing members. The clearing members then, in turn, pass it onto the CCP. This chart shows the infrastructure of cleared derivatives trading. Both the buyer and the seller pass margin to their respective clearing members, who then pass that margin onto the CCP for default protection. Current rules require banks that provide clearing services to hold capital against the notional of client positions as well as margin charged against the position, even though margin is designed to reduce rather than increase risk. 
This requirement has reportedly increased the cost of being a clearing member and has led some clearing members to exit that role. We were interested in identifying how the capital rules have affected the clearing business of banks. We based this analysis on the fact that capital rules are designed differently for different segments of the derivatives market. For instance, banks are subject to higher requirements than non-banks. In addition, capital rules have been written differently in different countries. For instance, the level of capital required is generally higher for U.S. banks than European banks. Capital requirements are also different for different derivatives. No capital is required to be held against positions in U.S. Treasuries expiring within a year, which are assumed to be incredibly safe. In contrast, a much higher level of capital is required for positions in equity indices, like the S&P 500, for a similar maturity. The table at the bottom of this slide, from the leverage ratio rule, highlights that capital requirements are proportional to 6% of the notional of an equity futures position. We focused our research on options. The derivatives products where the gap between the notional of a position and the risk of a position is especially large. Our analysis showed that clearing E-mini futures options has shifted in the way we anticipated, from institutions that are more constrained by capital rules to those less constrained. We provide a high-level overview of our results in this chart. The dark blue bars summarize the market share breakdown of equity clearing prior to the introduction of the leverage ratio, and the light blue bars summarize the breakdown after the introduction. You can see that in the earlier years, U.S. banks held the most dominant share of equity clearing, at around 46%. In the years after the rule change, U.S. bank business fell from 46% to just over 36%, a 10% drop. This drop was matched by increases in clearing through European banks and U.S. non-banks, two sets of entities where capital requirements are lower. None of those changes occurred for U.S. Treasury futures options clearing, where no capital charge is required. In fact, in recent years, U.S. banks were clearing an even larger share of Treasury business than before. You can see these different trends in this chart. The blue line plots the percentage of U.S. clearing business done by banks for e-mini options, and the red line plots the percentage for Treasury options. While the share of bank clearing fell dramatically over the time period for the e-mini contract, the share for treasuries slightly increased during the same time. You can see very similar trends when we compare the percentage of bank clearing done by U.S. banks across the two products. These changes in e-mini clearing are statistically significant, as shown in these regressions. We have highlighted the key coefficients in this table which summarizes the change in customer market share for U.S. banks after the introduction of the leverage rule. This coefficient is negative and significant, indicating a loss of market share for U.S. banks for e-mini options. In contrast, this coefficient is positive and insignificant for Treasury options. A number of additional regression comparisons can be found in the paper, such as changes in the amount of low delta clearing done relative to high delta clearing. The CFTC has not been the only policymaker interested in this set of questions. International regulators have taken initial steps to address these market effects. The Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, the International Standard Center for Capital Rules, is now seeking comment on whether risk-mitigating margin should require capital. In addition, U.S. regulators, such as the Federal Reserve, have proposed a different, more granular method to calculate capital required for derivatives. 
We would like to thank you for listening to this podcast. Hopefully, this has helped you understand markets, policy, and the interactions between the two a little bit better. Again, more details about our work can be found on the CFTC website, as well as a number of other research and white papers written by our office. Thank you again. The CFTC is providing this information as a public service, and it is neither a legal interpretation nor a statement of CFTC policy. Reference to any specific product, service, trademark, manufacturer, or service provider does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by the CFTC. The CFTC is not liable to any consumer or any third party or any direct, indirect, incidental, consequential, special, or exemplary damages for lost profit related to the use of the information provided or referenced in this podcast. Selection of guests on the podcast does not imply an endorsement of any particular individual or entity. Many individuals and entities provide similar services to those of the guest. The views and opinions expressed by the guests in the podcast are their own and not specifically endorsed by the CFTC. Moreover, the information provided in this podcast should not be construed as investment advice. Consumers should rely on their own inquiries as to accuracy and relevance of the information incorporated or referenced in this podcast and assume the entire risk related to its use. The CFTC is providing its interpretation of market trends solely to inform the public of a framework for projecting possible outcomes under different scenarios. If you have any questions concerning the meaning or application or a particular law or rule administered by the CFTC, please consult an attorney.